Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, so we're going to talk for a little bit. I have many, many questions about this wonderful book, and then uh, we're going to open the floor to you, and uh, we're going to we're just going to chat. So be ready with good questions, because I don't want to like volunteer anyone for questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Brian, um, to begin, I would love to hear kind of the origin story of this. What was kind of that first moment that you? Um, really had the idea for this book and thought there's something here and I think it's a lot. Yeah. Well, I think most people have probably had a moment like the one that I had that sort of set the spark for the book, which is whatever reason, you lose your phone, you are stuck on an airplane with, you know, without it for an hour or with, with, with it off, but I left my phone in a cab, like, you know, the most mundane thing imaginable, and it, the things that I could not do started piling up so fast. You know, I was missing work emails, missing calls from my wife, missing, you know, you, you're just immobilized. And it's this really mundane experience that is also weirdly powerful. And I, and I, I kind of started thinking, what, you know, what is behind that? Like, what, you know, made that, that sort of... Uh, nakedness as we describe it you know you leave your phone at home you're naked how did that it just seemed to creep up on us here i was a technology editor at a publication i'm supposed to know the inside and out of every gadget every technology that comes along and i started the more i thought about it the more i realized i didn't know you know that much about how we kind of arrived to now 10 years ago we maybe had a flip phone in our pockets maybe we had you know uh, some of us had Blackberries, uh, but in the mid 2000s, it was a totally different world. Every, the entire sort of structure of our routines was different. You know, the expectations of how we would communicate with people was different. And behind all this was sort of a revolution in technology that I realized I didn't understand as much as I should. So I kind of set out to pull this thing apart piece by piece and uh, look at the components of, you know, what made that experience possible. You mentioned BlackBerry, and I think that's kind of an interesting, um, <laughs> when we think about the visual component, like what the, the iPhone has allowed us to do and create visually, yeah. you can kind of see when you look through old photos, you can see, oh, that's when I moved from BlackBerry to iPhone, right. because the photo quality changes so much. Yeah. But that part has, has been so interesting, because it, you know, I think this comes up a lot. People talk about the role, kind of the changing role of the bystander because of the iPhone, yeah. and how that's really shifted so much. Yeah, I mean, it Pretty much everything has shifted uh, in sort of the migration from sort of that hard shell keyboard, you know, tiny bit of screen real estate based technology to where we are now, where everything is sort of focused on this visual currency, where we're, you know, the most popular apps and most popular things we're doing, most of it's predicated around uh, visual language and photos. And that just wasn't possible with the old sort of cellular phone model that had, you know, really been sort of the, the dominant norm for, for two decades or so. So yeah, you start, once the iPhone comes along, you start seeing, you know, citizen journalism with people snapping photos. You start seeing the rise of things like Instagram and, you know, style and trends start evolving differently. Uh, and, you know, we interact with them differently because we're touching and we're swiping and we're sizing and, you know, editing photos on the fly. So it, it really has been um, an interesting shift on that front, like you say. One thing I, I really enjoyed so much about this book, and there, there were many things, I, I loved it very much. Um, you know, a lot of times, t uh, tech writing or writing about something technical it tends to be very just by the book, and like, here are the facts, here are the things. But this was a story. This was, this was a really fascinating story. And even from the very beginning, when, when you're sitting there, when you're kind of like looking at these guts of this open iPhone, at that point, you're reminded almost of a surgical operation, and suddenly it becomes kind of a person. It's a character in this book. And then it, be, it kind of morphs into a bit of a travel companion for you throughout this book, and I wonder if you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I kind of thought that, as I mentioned earlier, that that might be the best way to approach this um, instead of just kind of, you know, going into Apple or reaching out to whoever I could and saying, oh, who had the idea for this? How did the, you know, how did, at what point in Apple did you decide to, uh, you know, put a home button on it or that kind of thing? I thought, 
if, like, if I could imagine this thing as the table of contents is actually each of the core you know, technological components and figuring out which ones to include took some doing too, uh, then you could you know, really have 10, 12, 20 stories about you know, the most in integral parts of this technology. Uh, so yeah, so that was a really kind of a revelatory moment for me too because one thing that Apple does really well is sort of dissuades us from thinking about it as technology in the first place, thinking about the iPhone as technology in the first place. It's more of like a bobble. It's this shiny, you know, responsive, intuitive to use uh, gadget that, 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 you know, we don't really think that much about, you know, what kind of processor it's running or, you know, what kind of materials have to be mined to make it or, you know, the list goes on and on. And a lot of that is to Apple's, uh, you know, benefit and they, you know, they, they do it, you know, both because it looks good and because it makes it easier on them uh, in, in hastening the upgrade cycle and sort of owning the repair. You know, if you want it fixed, you take it to, to Apple, you don't do it yourself. Um, so it was really kind of, you know, again, I as a technology editor had until that point been mostly interested in the specs, the features, what does it do, you know, some cultural considerations. But seeing it sort of laid bare, seeing its guts on the table, I think that's a, that's a great comparison. It was, you know, this new character, this new uh, thing that I had to understand from a brand new, uh, you know, brand new angle and perspective. So uh, threading that together, getting to know the different elements of the character uh, was really sort of the journey of the book. And, you know, it just like, you know, you mentioned, it's, it did take a travelogue to do that. I mean, the iPhone isn't possible without the input of parts, labor, ingenuity uh, from every corner of the globe. It just wouldn't be the same without sort of these countless invisible hands, you know, working on it. And you almost described that moment with, uh, there was a lot of vulnerability from you in that moment, talking about like, here's the guts of my iPhone, like <laughs> yeah. all this stuff, all these precious things are here laid out before me. I don't know if they're going to get back together and if it'll all be okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you know, and you, Apple you, voids your warranty if you try to do that yourself. And even in the hands of an experienced uh, repair company like iFixit, which I'd really encourage everybody to check them out. It's their sort of combating that ethos that I was talking about, this sort of closed ecosystem mindset that Apple has. They want everybody to learn what's in their phone and to open it up, uh, and which was sort of, you know, a very useful uh, com sort of spirit to serve as a companion uh, to this guide, uh, I mean, to this trip that I took. So, yeah, you know, you are kind of faced with this, with a, I guess it's a revelation, right? It's that that this thing that it has become so central, so important. All your data is on there, all your photos, all your. I mean, now it migrates to the cloud, but we still sort of associate it mostly with this one, uh, one, one device. So we do have this sense of protectiveness, this like you know that it's special, that we need it. Right, yeah. and yet there's almost an intimate component because like a lot of people sleep with it within arm's length, yeah. and and keep it on our person, and it's always very close to us, and right. uh, usually like right in our shirt pocket or our pants pocket. It's touching us even all at times. It is, and I, I I mentioned in the book that it's given me some of my maybe some of my most like intimate artifacts even, photos and, and, and memories and uh, on that front. Uh, when my wife called me, I was actually in Chicago uh, on a business trip for a story and my wife had randomly, she, she had felt a little sick and kind of on a whim got a, bought a pregnancy test and she called me uh, to tell me that she, that she was pregnant and you know, tears were streaming down her face. It was this emotional, incredibly powerful moment. And I, you know, without thinking, you, know, you can take screenshots. We were FaceTiming, and I just started snapping these <laughs> screenshots, just kind of as a reflex, because this device has trained me that way. And they're some of the, mo the, the most spectacular photos that, that I have anywhere for anything. It, it's, it's, it really gave me sort of that memory in, in crystal clarity, and, and it, almost nothing is more precious than that, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the moment in the book where it seems like the, the phone is shifting from uh, 
a, a character laid out on the surgery table into the travel companion is when you are in the cab in China and it becomes, there you are in pursuit of its parts and beginning this journey mm -hmm. and yet it's kind of navigating you and saving your life in that moment too. Yeah, I mean, some of these things are really deceptive. Some of the functions and the things that it's slowly making normal or uh, you know, allowing us to do, they don't seem uh, all that mind-blowing anymore because, again, the creep to normalcy has been so uh, sort of quiet and so uh, total that we don't really recognize how, how mind-blowing some of this stuff is. I mean, so the scene she's talking about is when I first got to China, uh, and I was, my, I, I was traveling to China to try to look into its supply chain, to try to uh, get a read on how uh, the factory system was currently operating. There was a big uh, controversy uh, around 2010, 2011 about how Foxconn, Apple's major supplier, treats its workers. So I was going to update that story. The very first thing that happens is I get in a cab. Uh, you know, my, my, my phone is dead, but my, the driver has one, and he's interested. He's asking me questions, and we find we can't, you know, I don't know any Mandarin. He doesn't know any English, but he has, an, he has a translator app on his phone. So he asks me, you know, what, what, what are you doing? And he, and he sets it down on the middle console, and I answer the question, and a serviceable translation pops out. So basically, we have this universal translator in a cab as we're speeding down a highway in Shanghai, and we're conversing. Something like that would not have been possible 10 years ago. And the fluidity by which it allowed us to communicate was really, really incredible to me. Uh, I learned about, you know, sort of the wage conditions in, in, for, for cab drivers in, in China. He gave me some contacts, people to talk to, that he, you know, almost everybody who uh, knows somebody who has at one time worked for Foxconn or a Foxconn adjacent company. So he, we, we talked a little bit about that. But just sort of that moment which happened, right, as kind of, I was kind of embarking on the research and reporting process for, that, for this trip, kind of underlined and underscored sort of just the potency of, of, of the phone and kind of really got at the core of what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder if we could shift a little bit and talk, you, you spend a good deal of time talking about it as a, as a product, as the phenomenal product that it is and, and how unique it is as a product. I wonder if you could kind of explain some of that for those who perhaps haven't read it yet. Because that's so interesting, it's one of those things, it is so ubiquitous, it's everywhere, it's not weird to look at a crowd of people and see everybody looking at a phone, and yet when you really think about it in market, marketing and business terms, it is a lot more remarkable than we perhaps realize. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it took a few really, I guess, in, in terms of you know, the business world, revolutionary leaps. Um, there had never been a touchscreen-based consumer product on, that was functioning on glass, that was sold to, that was intended as a mass market consumer product. Uh, it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have, up until that point, we were all doing uh, flip phones or the Razor phone or, 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 or Blackberry, and this was really kind of an incredible leap to use this technology. Not just, you know, to touch with one hand, there had been some efforts to do touchscreen, even as, as early as the 90s. Uh, but to do multi-touch, where you're actually manipulating the screen itself with fingers, with gestures, and interacting with a computer in, in, a, in a primitive language that, that hadn't really been put out before. So as, I mean, as a product, it actually kind of had its origins in kind of a mundane space, and that was that Apple had stumbled up upon another sort of company-defining product, the iPod, a few years before, and once that, that had sort of rocketed to ubiquity, um, they, the, sort of the, the business minds in Apple, some of the executives started seeing a problem. And that was the iPod had put a focus onto the MP3 and had really started making other companies think about what they could do with MP3s. And of course, the obvious sort of space to do that in was cell phones. So I, Apple saw a fast dawning future where cell phones would start having MP3s, and they were worried that that would eat the iPod's lunch in the, in the marketplace, because if you have two devices, you're not, you know, and you only need one, even if, no matter how cool the iPod was, you, you know, the thinking was that they would leave that at home and take just the phone. 
So they set about trying to design a product that would sort of preempt the, the competition, and they famously fumbled the ball first with a really clumsy uh, effort with a, a, a collaboration uh, I, I, w w with Motorola, I believe, to, to you know, make this kind of crappy I Apple branded iTunes playing, but you know, handset that was really a big disaster. Uh, and right after that, Steve Jobs was not one to tolerate disasters, so him and his executive circle really set about doing the phone right, and that was sort of the seed that allowed them to start pulling from different research projects within the companies. A lot of these were kind of behind closed doors, like, you know, blue sky. A lot of the people working on them thought that they were going to be, you know, uh, element, like the multi-touch stuff, they had thought that that was going to be for either a tablet or for the trackpad of a Mac, so they had been kind of toiling in obscurity, and suddenly it reached this, uh, this point where Steve Jobs said, okay, let's try that and, and that and that. Um, and, and from there they were, you know, able to, uh, well, it's a long story, but it's in the book. I <laughs> <laughs> get the book, get the book. Yeah. Um, so in working through this and, and reporting and, and traveling and doing all this stuff for this book, is there anything that made you go, oh my gosh, I'm going to use my phone so differently from here on out? Well, you know, I, through the reporting process, I got to know the functions of the phone pretty well and the, uh, the I think more uh, in terms of uh, what, what was sort of shocking about it was more kind of in the, on the supply chain side and sort of some ethical considerations about how the phone is made. Um, I'd say that that left a bigger mark. Uh, it, you know, it's Apple's this global sprawling operation and they just source their metals and their supplies from companies uh, and outfits of every stripe. Uh, but, you know, things like, as I uncovered in the book, they were using uh, basically child labor to mine some of this, the, the tin that was used in only a very small, uh, you know, portion of the phone, the solder in the chips. Uh, and, and, you know, other reporters have found similar problems with the cobalt that goes into their batteries. The Washington Post did a great uh, investigative piece about that. But there are all sorts of uh, ethical concerns about the phone that are not foregrounded nearly often enough. You know, once in a while, something like Foxconn, when you have workers who are so desperate that they're committing suicide because of the work conditions, um, then you know some press coverage will result and things can change a little bit. But even then, as you know, I was finding in the book, mostly cosmetic changes. So not a whole lot has um, changed in the way that they. But and I should also say that Apple isn't even the, the the worst offender on these fronts. It just has sort of the most power and the most sort of political and social capital to to make changes. So I, I'd say that was the thing that surprised me the most is. Uh, sort of the things that, that happen on the darker side of, of the supply chain. Is that the thing you wish more people knew about the iPhone? Or was there, were there other things that, that came up that you thought, oh man, if people realize this, or when people realize this, this will change? Yeah, two things. Uh, that, the sort of the unethical labor practices, which, you know, they have, they state very clearly that they will have, that they do not tolerate um, any uh, unethical l labor conditions in their supply chain. That's, that is their code, that, that, and they have certain things that they say that they will do, but it's just not upheld often enough. Um, so, so yeah, so that on one end, the mining and the, uh, the manufacturing uh, are, are, are difficult things that, that Apple should confront uh, more emphatically. Uh, the other thing is just the fact that there is, again, this universe of people that contribute to the iPhone or have in the past who are, foot, if even, footnotes in its story. So the, the other thing that I really hoped to uh, accomplish in the book is to really make clear how, how many people contribute to, to the technologies, the ideas, the patents, the, you know, the, the blood and the sweat and the tears, and how far back some of those uh, legacies go. Uh, it, it's not, you know, Apple in a, in a couple conference room making a few 
brash decisions and following. And, and these guys work very, very hard. A lot of these guys are genuinely brilliant, but you know they're resting on generations of uh, of, of brilliance too. So, so I was really hoping to spotlight kind of the, that sprawling history on one end, sort of these invisible, um, you know, uh, minds and hands and and, and 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 workers who have all contributed to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a bit too about CERN Labs. That was really such an, an interesting part of the book and, and very interesting characters in that part. Yeah, so when I was going down the, the rabbit hole of, of, of multi-touch, which I had spoke to a number of experts and they kind of agree that that's one of the main things that set the iPhone apart was this multi-touch technology. So it was really crucial to uh, uh, understanding how the iPhone came to be and became the powerhouse that it is. So I started looking at these old patents and old stories uh, written about it, which there isn't much, you know? Multi-touch is not really this sexy discipline, you know? It, it's not like Johnny Ive and their industrial design team where they're, you know, brushing aluminum and doing all kinds of things that could, you know, one day end up in the MoMA or something. Multi-touch is this really kind of boring, you know, developed in air traffic control uh, systems by an engineer in an air, air traffic control uh, uh, group in the, in the British uh, Air Force. And really this, it's sensor, you know, activity and it's, you know, it's figuring out how to apply pressure to a screen and, and it really, but it's, that doesn't make it any less sort of amazing what these guys were able to do. And one of the earliest sort of actual real world uh, applications of multi-touch technology was at CERN, where I visited and met this guy who I'm sure no one's heard of him, Bent Stump, but he is certain that his technology that he developed in CERN to help control these, you know, <laughs> these, photo these proton accelerators that are massive in a little control room on the border of France and Switzerland, uh, was one of the first uses of a technology that would mature and end up uh, in, in the iPhone. So you, you kind of have to look down these weird hallways, these weird histories, uh, and he, you know, he showed me the very place he sat. It was in this weird bamboo hut that they set up for him to work on touchscreens, and he was a stone's throw away, coincidentally, from Tim Berners-Lee, who would go on to invent the the protocols for the World Wide Web. So it was really interesting to find little connections like that, the same environment where touchscreen technology was pioneered, so was the web that we use. And now that's everything. We're, we're touching websites with our fingers, we're clicking on them, we're expanding images. That's how we interact with the web. And that root, uh, you know, of both those, of that symbiosis was found, you know, over, 40 years ago in this, this uh, physics lab in, in, uh, in CERN. In the bamboo hut. <laughs> right. In a bamboo hut, yeah. <laughs> right. And so what place, in all the adventures that you had as a result of this book, what was the place that you ended up visiting that surprised you the most, that made you think, I would have never thought this place would be connected? I think it would have to be the, the tin mines in Bolivia, which it's just incredible to me that, the, I mean, these were the tin mines. They're a shadow of their former selves now, but they're some of the historically deadliest mines in the world, and that's because they basically bankrolled the Spanish Empire. Uh, it was, for a while, Potosi this was, was as big as London because so many people, traders, uh, laborers, slaves, were were living there and working in this vast network of mines uh, that, and that, that was shipping silver back to, back to Spain. And, uh, you know, and for centuries, this mine operated pretty much along the sa on the same, same conditions, same, you know, basic, it's a, it's a really primitive mine. And to go there today and see how little things have changed and how little, I mean, these the mining tunnels were held up by old splintering wood beams. They have mine carts, but a lot of them don't even have hard hats or, you know, and yeah, and children go in. It's 
vastly unregulated. And that's just one of the flows uh, where they, they don't get silver there anymore much. They get tin now. But I, I mean, I was there with a colleague who was also serving as my fixer. And we, you know, you can take guided tours. The miners started giving tours as a way to sort of highlight the conditions that they're living into people uh, around the world who would be happening by uh, as tourists or as travelers or as uh, whatever. But even on this guided tour, we got in there half an hour, and my the fixer was like, "I can't, I can't take this anymore. It's too, it's just, it's too dark. You're hunching down. You know, you really get the sense that the ceiling could cave in at any time, and 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 have that sort of that sort of condition, that set of conditions." Um, and that labor serve as one of the beginning points to what ends up as, as the iPhone was pretty profound to reckon with um, and to have that sort of visceral sense that this shiny gadget wouldn't be possible without people taking that risk every day. You know, in Bolivia, it's, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the tin mines in the DRC, it's cobalt. In Indonesia, you know, there's, it's, it's tin again, but there, these are very deadly mines that are, are supplying the stuff that makes our, uh, this new era of convenience as possible. Mm -hmm. And so what is, the, what is the stuff that did not make it into the final book? Oh boy, there, <laughs> there's a ton. Um, you know, I was really interested in lithium while we were doing it, which, is, which makes the, the batteries possible, and lithium has its own fascinating history. Uh, the first lithium battery was actually invented by a scientist working for ExxonMobil during the, during the oil crisis of the 70s. Exxon kind of, you know, had a, Exxon's board kind of looked at each other and said, well, our, this oil stuff might not be around too much longer. We might want to have a plan B. So they really made an earnest effort to sort of copy Bell Labs, which at the day was this really vibrant, bustling sort of uh, research lab and institution. And they, Exxon had its own version of that lab, and they were going to try to make um, uh, electric car technology. They were going to try to make uh, electric batteries. And one of the scientists experimenting with lithium, I mean, he 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 built he invented the the concept for the for the battery, but he couldn't get them to stop exploding and catching on fire. So somebody else took up his work, uh, and 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 eventually it became you know, the sort of the power source for not only electric cars, but phones, computers, laptops. Um, and it, it's a lot of people, especially those who are bullish on sort of the electric car revolution, think lithium is, the, is going to be sort of the next oil from a commodities standpoint. So I also vid visited this, uh, this, this place called Solar de Uyuni in, in Brazil, which is the largest deposit of lithium in the world. Uh, and you just go out there, it's just, you know, basically, imagine salt flats as far as the eye can see. People go there because you can take really funny photos because it's just, it's, it's the, the, the depth perception is really off, so you can stand 10 feet away behind somebody and go like that, you know, and make it look like you've got them on your fingers. So it's a big, it's, a, it's kind of like Bolivia's Grand Canyon. People visit that, but it's also the site of rapid lithium speculation. There are armed guards there. Our driver wouldn't take us close enough to the, to the, uh, the plant to see it because he was afraid of snipers or something. I, it was, it was a, you know, it's really this sense that there's this new frontier that as phones continue to become, you know, the global standard for communication and for, I mean, they already have become, but as from when we move from having, you know, two or three billion people with phones to, seven, it's, it's going to be that much more lithium required as, you know, Tesla, uh, as more people want Teslas and electric cars, you know, lithium's going to be that much more of a concern. But anyways, that was a chapter I wanted to include, uh, but cut for space. Yeah. 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 Um, what was the total timeline from start to finish for the project? Oh, well, I did, a, you know, pieces of it here and there, while, and then I eventually took leave to focus on it. So it was, ba it was basically, it was a pretty truncated, we wanted to get it out for the anniversary last year, so we kind of sped up our timeline, and I did most of the, 
research and re reporting and writing in the space of a year. So it was starting last, well, the February before last, um, broke open its guts at iFixit in California, flew out to China to try to get a sense of the supply chain, um, and then it was pretty much a year before I final, uh, submitted the final draft, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. And as word got out that you were working on this project, were, were there stakeholders or, or anyone in the industry that felt perhaps a little, let's say, nervous or, <laughs> or kind of uh, alarmed or put off by the project? Or resistant even to it? Yeah, of course. There was, I mean, Apple is notoriously, I give a little space to this in one of the chapters too, notoriously secretive. So Apple kept me at arm's length through the duration of the project. I did meet with some of their PR folks on the campus um, in Cupertino. Uh, they did sort of carrot me along and promise me interviews uh, or promise the possibility of interviews. So they were kind of uh, enigmatic throughout the process. It was like two months before publication. I said, look, we're gonna, I've, I'm gonna go to press with this. Is there any? They said, no, we're not gonna give you anything. So I said, all right, that's your call. So they were clearly, you know, some of their people were nervous about it, but on the other end of it was the fact that Apple is so secretive has kept so many of these people who, who really did such amazing work on the iPhone itself, these guys who are at Apple, who are really, in my mind, you know, as much to uh, you know, responsible for, for creating this device, people who developed the user interface uh, system, who, does, who developed the way the software works so intuitively with your hands, uh, Imran Chowdhury, Boss Ording, Greg Christie, these guys who really reinvented this new visual language for us to interact with computers with, uh, no one had ever heard of them. I found them by going through the patents and just making phone calls and that sense of secrecy, them getting sort of boxed out of the history. I mean, you say iPhone, who invented the iPhone? Nine times out of 10, somebody's gonna say Steve Jobs. Uh, just not the case. And there's dozens of people who, who came up with the key uh, ideas, components, machinations to make this thing possible. And th those who were not at Apple, and even some who were, started going, you know what, like I, I do want my story told. It's been 10 years, I, I, th I think we, the truth should be out there. So there's kind of started, you know, this, this back door sort of circuit. I started getting phone calls and LinkedIn messages, mm -hmm. people going like, I heard you talk to uh, Imran over there. Well, you, let's meet. I, I was literally meeting these guys at dive bars, going like, okay, you can't say this was me who told you that, but 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 Greg, he's the guy. Who, he's the guy who got us to got us to do multi-touch. Yeah, all the you know all these little you know sort of. It felt very cloak and dagger at times. Sometimes I felt like I was getting together to plan a bank heist or something. Right. You know, but it was uh, it was definitely interesting to to gather those stories often for the for the first time. Yeah. I, well, I think that theme comes up a lot in the book, right? Like as you said, you say iPhone, people think Steve Jobs. But in fact, when you start looking at patents and, and the sum of the parts of all the different patents that sit there in the phones that we hold, there's a lot of names on that. And I think that's a theme that kind of is echoed a lot that not only is each discovery kind of on the backs of the people before, but there's a lot of people in the room when things are happening. Yeah, I, one of the key architects of the, of the software, on the, of the iPhone software, the, the visual side, uh, told me that after the book published and uh, the, the Verge ran an excerpt that mentioned his name in it. He came into work that day and they gave him a standing ovation. These guys had no idea that he even worked on the iPhone. That's how secretive it is. Nobody even knew within the company, within your teams, because I mean there's a lot of turnover, it changes fast, but it took, it, it, it took that sort of, that, this, this, this public, you know, story, the story being made public for anyone to even know in the company that that, that was the history. And they said, oh man, that's cool. <laughs> you know, you, you actually in, in designed these icons, you invented this, this, this part of the platform. Uh, 
because it's really just the culture of secrecy goes all the way all the way down into yeah. all the departments. Yeah. Well, oh, that theme comes up too. I mean, we you, we all hear these stories out of Silicon Valley, you know, the tech giants of of se such secrecy that someone just right across the room is working on something you didn't know you were working on the same project together because you're so siloed. Yeah. I think that theme comes up a lot too. Yeah, it, it totally does, and it's not always pleasant for the people working on the team. It caused a lot of animosity, in particular the way that they sort of approached uh, coming up with the, the, the iPhone as a product in the first place. They had two tracks. They had one that was codenamed P1 and one that was codenamed P2, and one was basically taking the iPod, making it able to, take, to, to make, a, make calls. Um, and that team was led by one of the, the hottest shots at Apple at the time, Tony Fidel, who, had, who was one of the driving forces behind the iPod. So he owned that project and they were sort of working uh, almost kind of a competition with this team that was going to do the multi-touch version that was more software rich and after Jobs decided that they were going to go with, with the software rich approach he had the, the iPod crew do the hardware but there had already been such a, like the sense of competition and animosity sort of baked in that at that point you know they the hardware guys had no idea what the software even looked like. They weren't allowed to see it. They weren't allowed to see the screen. They weren't allowed to, you know, even even go in the room that these guys were working in, except for you know a, t a couple of the top executives on the team. So it was this bizarre sort of sense where the hardware guys actually had to design their own user interface that would never be seen by anyone, just so they would have something to test the hardware on. And they, and then you know, when they finally saw what the other guys had been working on, they were like, "Oh, well, I would have done this different. I would have done, you know." It was really this very strange way to approach a, a yeah. project, but you know, ultimately successful. Because on the other end of this, you know, they, you had these guys who were having falling outs with their former comrades, work, having it be weird to sit in the cafeteria with your former, um, you know, buddy at work. Uh, the flip side of all that secrecy is that one of the executives who was at the company at the time told me that it was maybe worth up to half a billion dollars because so, so little leaked. The, that they were able to go, this is the iPhone, and then have sort of the technology world and, and sort of lose its breath over it and you know, herald it as the Jesus phone and all these other colorful terms that came out at the time. All that which was at the time was called free press, but it's, you see the toll of it uh, by, by looking at what everybody went through to do it. Uh, but there's a real value, a monetary value to that secrecy too. Mm -hmm. And so other than getting people standing ovations at work, how, <laughs> has, how has the reception been? What, what other stories have emerged about people realizing their coworkers did more or what has changed since the book come out, has come out? Well, I was in interest. The only thing that Apple actually pushed back against is that um, there's a scene that was relayed to me by a number of Apple employees who, where Apple's current uh, VP of marketing, one of the you know head honchos at, at Apple, this story was relayed to me uh, by enough sources that I found it credible to to include that sort of at the key decision point when they were sitting behind closed doors with. Uh, just a handful of executives in the room, um, and they were going to make the push to do it uh, as a multi-touch device, as a screen-based device. Uh, this VP stood up and said, we're making a huge mistake. Yeah, I'm not going to stand for it. We got to have hard buttons. We got to be like the BlackBerry. That's the market space. And, you know, Steve Jobs stood up and threw him out of the meeting, and it was this big dramatic event. Um, so far, that's that was the only thing that he personally, he, he, he denied that on Twitter, and it turned into a whole kerfuffle. Uh, but besides that, they haven't pushed back against any of the other reporting. They even told me that they admitted uh, that, that after the book came out, they stopped using um, the, the supplier that sourced the tin mines, so they stopped, stopped uh, uh, using the mine that had child labor in it in that case. Uh, so there have been actual substantive things that have come out of the, of, of the book too. Mm -hmm. What about reader reception? How's that been? Good, yeah. I think, I, you know, I think a lot of people 
go into the book expecting it to sort of be just an all Apple book. You know, this is the story of when Steve Jobs did this, when Tony Fidel should appear, uh, you know, when Andy Grignon said this, or, you know, uh, but it's more expansive than that. So I, I, I kind of think that uh, some people love that and are like, wow, you know, I, <laughs> I didn't expect to be learning about how sort of this European consortium, you know, sort of paved the way for uh, a, a universal cell, cell phone standard <laughs> in, you know, mm -hmm. chapter 11 or whatever, but, uh, but I'm glad I know it. You know, there's, there's been some people who just, who want more, you know, want more Steve Jobs, want more, uh, want more Apple gossip, uh, but that's not really the book that I set out to write. Yeah. yeah. What did you want in the book that, that, that you, like, didn't, you know, we talked a little bit about, like, what you had to cut, but what was the interview you didn't get or the, or the thing that just kind of eluded you in that process, if anything? I wanted an on-the-record interview with um, Scott Forstall, who was the VP of, uh, of, of, of Apple's software, uh, and kind of the guy who was Tony Fidel, the, the iPod and the iPhone hardware guy. He was kind of his uh, competitor, and they were kind of butting heads, and if you look back, you'll see all these stories about, you know, the heir to Steve Jobs' throne, and it's usually one of one or two of these guys. Um, and Scott Forstall was pretty publicly uh, sacked or stepped down or was after, in the wake of the, the Apple Maps disaster a few years ago, um, when Apple launched their competitor to Google Maps and it just didn't work. It was directing people to drive into the middle of a lake and stuff like that. Um, and he there was already some tension between him and Tim Cook after Steve Jobs had passed. Um, so he left in a very public way, and I wasn't able to get an uh, on-the-record interview with him uh, because he doesn't talk to anybody. Yeah. He kind of, he just went silent. He's, uh, he started producing Broadway plays. <laughs> it was his, sure, as yeah, you do as after you that. Do after leaving Silicon Valley. So um, his, you know, I have, I have since, you know, I've t I, I, did, I, I did get in touch with him and I did talk to him. So I did have his uh, general fee, but he, but he wouldn't give an interview. So I think that would be very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just one more question and then I want to get to some questions because I'm sure that you have burning questions there. But um, if you could return to yourself at the beginning of this project mm. uh, as yourself now and say, here is my advice for you what would that piece of advice be? Yeah, well, I think that would be a wonderful tool to have, right? <laughs> to be able to, an app that transports right. you to the beginning of a book project, do it again. I, you know, knowing what I know now, um, so, so much of this process was chasing down so many leads. It, was, it really was just this, this mess of forking paths where you meet this guy and he says, oh, well, the guy who really did that was this guy at Bell Labs in 1962. And you go, okay, okay, okay. And then he's like, oh, no, no, you want to talk to, to Dirk over it. And he, so you can chase these sort of legacies uh, of technology all the way, you know, back as distant, distant horizons. But it, 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 knowing what I know now, I might have confined it even further and really drilled down onto uh, a few more of the spaces uh, that that were sort of had had more grab things like multi-touch I was pleased with the way that multi-touch came out and the first chapter sort of about the idea and the conception of the smartphone and what it means to have a smartphone and what we want in a device that we keep in our pockets all of the time I mean it turns out people had ideas about what that was in the late 1800s. So uh, th th things like that, maybe limiting uh, the, the, the breadth of the research and, and focusing a bit more on, on some of the characters. Um, because it was, if only for just my mental health, it was a crazy, sprawling project to try to keep on track, of, you know, keep on top of over such a short amount of time. Uh, but I am pleased with with the result and, and, you know, you learn every project you do. So. As well, you should be pleased. It's a really, really wonderful book. It was a fascinating read, start to end. Well, what, uh, what is, what's next? I lied, I had one more question. 
Um, well, I'm actually going to go to the other end of the spectrum, and my next book is going to be about uh, the Luddites and mm. the dawn of automation and the dawn of sort of the interaction between human and machines, um, especially as we're facing sort of this next uh, frontier where AI and, and software uh, is on the verge of automating all sorts of jobs from you know, truck driving to service industry jobs to you know, actually making hamburgers and things like that. Uh, we could use, I think anyways, personally, a, uh, an, a, a, a corollary, a, an example, a use case to sort of sink our teeth into uh, to, to, to see what, what, what actually happened when it did because these guys, uh, the Luddites, who were textile workers at the uh, beginning of the 18th century, um, the very first sort of factories started coming along and sure enough, they lost their jobs to, to, to automation, um, and it, the economy wasn't as diversified as it is today. It wasn't like they could just go get a job, you know, with Uber or something. You know, they had trained. You had to train seven years to be a textile worker, to be a, a cropper, or to be um, a, a lace worker. It was a very highly regulated, highly regimented, very uh, artistic craft and then all of a sudden a machine comes along and says okay we can do six of your jobs in an hour with this machine and of course there was no uh, no set of benefits or state there's no safety net for them to fall back on so they you know the common misconception about Luddites is that they hated technology they didn't hate technology they used it to a certain degree to do their own work they hated that they were losing their jobs without any recourse, without any, so they, they're just getting swept away. So all of a sudden you see 30% of an entire town without a job. So what do you do? You fight back. And these guys really started this very interesting decentralized uh, underground movement where they would band together, cover their faces in coal and sneak into factories and smash the machines that were taking their jobs. It really was kind of a zero sum game then because if they smash the machines, guess who gets their job back? So they were strategically doing this and they eventually re resorted to measures that were um, much less benign, but uh, I think we can learn a lot about sort of the machinations and how automation impacts communities and how it might impact some of these more skilled but not necessarily educated uh, workforces. I mean. There are millions of truck drivers in the country. Right? What happens if over the course of five years, the, the, the job that has the most employees in a great many US states, suddenly Tesla trucks are, are, are doing their work? What happens when you uproot you know, a, a million workers who've been doing it for 10 years, 12 years, 20 years? You know? Sounds like a perfect time for that book, for sure. Oh, a very, very timely so. read. What's the timeline on that? Do we know yet? Uh, I'm delivering that next year, so it, it's, right. called, uh, it's called Blood in the Machine, tentatively. We're all going to meet back here for that, all right, when that's see, ready. See you back here, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so let's turn it over to you. What questions do you have? Right there, right up front. Where do you see the iPhone going? What's, what's, what's going to happen to it next? What do you think of Yeah, that's, it's an interesting question. It's one that, you know, could... could Endlessly debate. The question was, where do you see the iPhone going next? Yeah. Um, my answer is kind of boring because I think that they're going to continue to tweak and iterate various forms and functions of it, but there hasn't been a radical upgrade. I mean, as, as, much, as, uh, as much fuss was made over this iPhone X or the iPhone X, there was very little done to the basic sort of uh, sandbox that, that they're working with. It's still a grid of apps that you open with your finger that you, you know, that you unlock, you know, various uh, functionalities through a third-party app system. There hasn't been a lot of crazy sort of leapfrog in the way that the iPhone was a leap over the, the iPod. So, and Apple doesn't really have an incentive to do that much different. This is such a cash cow that 
if they, as long as they put you know, a little AR into it here, if they get a better screen here, they can and still are getting people to shell out you know, anywhere between six to a thousand, twelve hundred dollars for a new model. So for the foreseeable future, I think that's going to be their approach. And Tim Cook gets heat for that every single upgrade cycle, every single year. Oh, Apple's lost its ability to innovate since Steve Jobs is gone. Well, you know, maybe that's true, but Apple's still the most valuable company on the on the planet in a given day. It's still turning revenues around that are unheard of, really historically. It's app services economy. Just that, just the apps, just its third-party online software services is now, by some counts, bigger than all of Hollywood. And that's it would be a Fortune 100 company all on its own if you were to cleave that off. And it's still nothing compared to its iPhone sales, uh, which is still about two-thirds of its revenue. So it's just a behemoth. And I think, you know, they're just in, they're facing the innovator's dilemma. And the answer right now is that they don't really have to innovate. Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, yes, right here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, that'd be a, just a matter of opinion. For, but I personally, Sophie Wilson, who um, was uh, who helped design the the ARM uh, board that it was called the Acorn Risk machine, which is kind of esoteric. But they were a British competitor to Apple, and in the '80s, she came up with the, the, the sort of the systems architecture that has now uh, sort of taken over the world. And she was just an incredible character. Um, she just whip smart, just a, a photographic memory. Um, and they, she was working for a tiny company and it was really just her and another engineer and they had so few resources uh, and they were going into battle basically against the giants, against IBM and Intel in designing these chips. They, so out of necessity, they found a really efficient way to design these chips that would use uh, less, less energy and it would use fewer sort of cycles to get the same sort of, they were squeezing more, more power out of a limited uh, s s sort of set of machinery. Um, and ARM now, thanks to its really innovative sort of licensing model, instead of making chips and then selling them, they would just design the architecture and then license them to the big companies who would then make them themselves. Um, it's since eclipsed everybody else as your phone has an ARM chip in it. Uh, it's, it, it it's really one of the fascinating stories. Um, and just the way that she, she, I think she works at Broadcom now, if I'm not mistaken, or at least she did when I was interviewing her. Um, and she's a great example of one of these people who's just absolutely brilliant, but in the 80s and 90s, she didn't really fit the mold of, uh, of, of this, you know, turtlenecked, you know, tech guru, visionary. Uh, she's transgender, uh, and that has, she says, led to certain difficulties uh, in the field. Uh, but, but, to, but to hear her stories and her innovation and to hear uh, how she sort of interacted with it all was just, was just fascinating to me. Yeah, right here. The question was, uh, how, where does the Android fit into the, all of this? Yeah, Android is another really interesting story. Uh, as was uh, r reported in um, another book, Android had been the secret project at Google to do a phone, and they had a model uh, with, with, with the hard buttons like BlackBerry, and they were about to debut it uh, shortly after Jobs debuted the, the iPhone. And once they saw Steve Jobs' presentation and they saw the touchscreen phone and everything, they said, we're, we're starting over. And they scrapped their whole project and basically, you know, famously kind of emulated a lot of the key functionalities of the phone from the multi-touch to the grid of apps to, you know, the, even the, the form factor uh, for, for a long time. And that's been the basis of you know, some very famous, very, some of the industry's biggest lawsuits have been over how much Android copied 
uh, Apple's work. And I don't think that there's any dispute that they did, to a large degree, copy what Apple did with the iPhone. Um, it's just sort of whether or not that you can, you, can, you, can, you can litigate that, whether they're you know, expanding upon it in a productive way or, 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 or whatnot. Um, but the Android served, incidentally, as kind of an ambassador for Apple's technologies because what they did is Google you know, just built the, the operating system and the software and then basically would license it to handset makers like Samsung or LG and who were then able to make much cheaper phones uh, and, and get them into more hands. So the iPhone was always on the expensive side. It was never going to reach as many markets, especially uh, as abroad. But in my view, anyways, what, what Android has done has they've sort of popularized the sort of the smartphone vernacular that right the language that we use is you know it's fairly uniform even if the actual individual apps are different and some functions and some some uses are different it's basically helped to uh, sort of standardize what we think of as a smartphone. Can Great. Time for just one more question on the other side. Where are we looking? There's a super bright light right in my face. There it is. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed your talk today. I appreciate oh, thank you. it. And I'm looking forward to reading the book. Uh, in your information gathering, did you come across any studies regarding brain cancer? Or um, if, you, if you did, I'd like to hear about that. Yeah, it's a really, you know, it's a really interesting um, space. And the, I, I did talk to a number of folks who'd raised this issue. Um, and I think that the consensus is so far is that there's just not enough information out there to, to, to come down with a verdict one way or the other. I think you get, the, you know, the rec most people would recommend, you know, having a case that, that buffers it or always holding it away from your ear a little bit, not letting your uh, young children use it directly. Um, uh, most of the science does say that the, that the amount of radiation it's emitting is, is, is small enough that it's most likely not going to cause brain cancer. Or, but, but there's still, I mean, this is, we're basically kind of getting to the end of the first generation that's grown up putting phones to their ears. So we're gonna, we might see you know, other, other uh, byproducts uh, of, that, of that phenomenon. Uh, so I, it's just... Unfortunately, it's too early to tell. You know, my, I have a two-year-old son, and we're always kind of trying to, you know, just even if it's just sitting there, it's it's just one of those cases of you. We don't we you don't know. It's probably not a major problem, but again, it, the jury's out. Indeed. All right. Well, thank you all for being here today. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Gonna stick around and sign books. Yeah, yeah. He's gonna stick around and sign books. If you have any other little questions, maybe you're feeling a little shy, whatever you can you can ask him then. But thank you all for coming out today, Brian. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you.